a time to thank and praise God. Let us say the Christian family prayer together. Our Father in the heavens all around us, honoured be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive anyone who sins against us. Lead us not into temptation, but protect us from all evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. time for some English. The first word is harass. It's a verb. If you harass someone, you keep annoying them. You keep giving them a hard time. You persistently irritate or torment them. You keep doing what the other person doesn't like. Other words with a similar meaning include hound, badger, pester. Example one, have you ever been harassed by phone calls from people trying to sell you stuff? It happens all the time. What makes it worse is that even after you say you're not interested, they just won't stop talking. And sometimes it gets so bad that you just have to hang up. Example two, reporter, Ms. Paulina Zuras says that Mexico has a lot of work to do if it wants to help women who are harassed in the workplace. She says that a study in 2016 revealed that over 1.3 million Mexican women reported being harassed while at work. However, only 14,000 women 
went on to make an official complaint. The next word is honour. To honour someone is to treat them with great respect, as you can see in the picture there. It is to show them great respect, especially in public. It is to give someone public praise or reward. Other words with a similar meaning include glorify, esteem, exalt. Example one. Every year thousands of people right round Australia honour those men and women who died of war by going to see an Anzac Day march. They didn't have one this year, did they? Have you ever been to a march? Anyone? Yeah, I have because my husband was marching in it. <laughs> Example two, pro skater Mr Tony Hawk says that for almost 40 years every skater has tried to perfect the mute grab where you grab the toe side of the board between your feet while rotating back side to land facing the opposite direction. Thank you. He says the trick should be renamed the Weddle Grab to honour its inventor, Mr Chris Weddle, a deaf skater who first performed the trick back in 1981. Mr Weddle, now 54, says he is stoked by the idea. Now, opportunity for discussion. How do you honour someone in your culture or family? Uh, talk to the people near you and you've got two minutes. All right. Okay. Is that all right, like that? <laughs> Okay, uh, two minutes is up. I hope you've had enough time. Now we'll move on to the next word, which is religion. Religion is the belief and worship of a god or gods. Religion is the system that explains what you believe in. Religion is the system that describes how you worship. Religion is the belief and worship of a supernatural power, especially a personal god or gods. Example one, anthropologist Mr. Stephen 
Yuan says there are almost as many religions in the world as there are languages. There are some 4,300 religions of the world compared with 6,800 living languages spoken in the world. That's a lot, isn't it? A lot of languages and a lot of religions. The three largest religions are Christianity, 2.1 billion people, Islam, 1.3 billion people, and Hinduism with 900 million people. Example two, American reporter Ms. Catherine Kirsten says that racial justice is quickly becoming the new religion of young people. She says, for many young people who are restless after the COVID-19 lockdown and who often know little about history or religion, racial justice can be part of a search for meaning in our post-Christian society. And we've seen that with the Black Lives Matter demonstrations. Uh, discussion. Three questions. What is the main religion in the country you were born in? What is one thing you like about it? And what is one thing you don't like about it? Again, two minutes. Time to hear and think about God's words. Before we hear God's words, let's pray. Together, God gracious, a gracious God, your word is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Today, as we hear your voice, please open our hearts to you and strengthen us in your ways so that we may live for you. Amen. Today's reading is from the Bible, John 5. The Apostle John says this, The day on which Jesus healed the paralyzed man was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man, Who had been healed? It is the Sabbath. It is illegal for you to carry your mat. But he replied, the man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is that fellow who told you to pick up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was 
because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd and that, uh, that was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, now you are well. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. So from then on, the Jewish leaders began harass, harassing Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules. But Jesus replied, My father is always working, so am I. So the Jewish leaders tried all the hardest to find a way to kill him because this was, was not only breaking the Sabbath rules, but also he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus explained, I'll tell you the truth. The son who does nothing by himself, he does only what he sees the father's doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. Because the father loves the son, includes him in everything he's doing. In fact, the father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man. Then you will, you will truly be astonished. Because just as the father gives lives to those he raised from the death, so the son gives the lives to anyone he wants. And the father judges no one. Instead, he has given the son the authority to judge so that everyone will honor the son just as they honor the father. Anyone who does not honor the son is not honoring the father who has sent him. I'll tell you the truth, anyone who listens to my message and believes in the one who sent me has eternal life. They will never be condemned, but they have already passed from death into life. This is the word of Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all sitting so neatly in your distances. Uh, today we're continuing our series on uh, John's Gospel, and we're looking at this um, quite an aggressive, I think, conversation between the Pharisees and, and Jesus. And we're looking at the idea of uh, honouring the Son and why that's important. So that's, I guess, the big idea today. Um, how about we begin by praying? Father, we thank you that you are who you are and that in your goodness and mercy and power and purity, you invite us to come to you as we are and to receive the gift of eternal life, of forgiveness, of a, a new way of being, of living our lives with your son Jesus in our lives. And today we ask that by your spirit, you will work in our spirit so that we would want to honour your lovely son. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, friends, I have to, uh, a confession to begin with today. And during this week, I was thinking, you know, if I lived 2,000 years ago, just before Jesus came, I really would have loved to be a Pharisee. Really, I, I would love to be a Pharisee. And I've actually got a photo here to show you. Thank you, Isaac. Which may help you imagine me being a Pharisee. Now, you need to look very carefully at this photo. Very, very carefully. And you will see a very happy-looking Pharisee, really. And, you know... I was thinking, you know, I really would really want to be a, a Pharisee. And you probably shouldn't laugh because I think that some of you who are here, some of you would also like to be a Pharisee. Now let me explain why. Well, you see, 2,000 years ago, the Pharisees were the good guys. They were the good people. They were the middle class respectable people who you could trust. That's who they were. 
And really, I, you know, you, you, you have to admire these people because they, they really wanted to know how to please God. That's who they were. They were people who took God's law very, very seriously. And so they tried very, very hard to look at God's law that God gave to Moses and Moses gave to the people. These people tried very hard to understand how that good law applied in daily human life. And by the time that Jesus you know, came into the world, the religion of the Pharisees had become very, very complex. You know, these people over hundreds of years carefully looked at the law of God given on Mount Sinai and they interpreted the law of God. They expanded the law of God. And so by the time that Jesus arrived on the scene, the religion of the Pharisees was very complex. So complex, they had over 600 rules that you had to obey if you wanted to be a good person and follow God. And it seems that the you know, most popular series of rules for these people was the Sabbath rest. Yeah, they were very keen on making sure that everyone in Israel kept the Sabbath holy. And so they had lots and lots of rules about how to do that in your life. And so I wanted to share with you just three of their rules that they taught people you had to keep if you wanted to be a holy person, a good person. So the first one, thank you, Isaac, is this. They taught that a woman was not allowed to pin a bow onto her dress. A woman wasn't allowed to do that. And the reason, they said, was because they thought pinning something onto your dress was carrying it, carrying the bow. And carrying the bow meant working, and so you can't pin a bow onto your dress because you're working, and so you're breaking the Sabbath. Now, the second rule they had was this. They said, thank you, Isaac, you can't light a candle on the Sabbath day because that's working, and you can't work on God's day of rest. And thirdly, they said, you're not allowed to carry your mat because you guessed it, carrying your mat is working. However, friends, the rules that these people came up with were very complex. And so even though a woman wasn't allowed to pin a bow onto her dress, she could sew the bow onto her dress. And if she sewed the bow onto her dress, then she wasn't carrying it. Then she wasn't working. Then she wasn't breaking the Sabbath. And although you weren't allowed to light a candle on the Sabbath, you were allowed, under their law, to pay someone who wasn't a Jew to light the candle for you. Now that's very handy, isn't it? And thirdly, if you needed to take your bathroom mat somewhere, well, you couldn't carry it, right? But their law said you could wear it. You know, you could wrap it around your neck like a scarf, and then you're no longer carrying it because now your bathroom mat has become a fashion accessory. Now, friends, I know these things sound silly and frustrating, and they are, but that's not why I want to be a Pharisee or not why I would have enjoyed being a Pharisee before Jesus came. The reason I, I think, would like to be a Pharisee is because being a Pharisee made it very easy for you to be right and other people to be wrong. That's what a Pharisee did. Being a Pharisee, following their law, made it very easy to know who was good and right and who was corrupt and wrong. And friends, I thought about it this week. I would really like that. And to be honest, I think most of you would like that too. Because we all like that. We all like that feeling of being right and good. 
and condemning other people for not doing the good that we do. That is human nature. And so the truth is that many of us sitting here would secretly probably like to be a Pharisee before Jesus came because then he showed very clearly why they were wrong. Now, friends, everyone does it. Everyone wants to be good. Everyone loves condemning other people. We all do it. Our society does it all the time. For example, you've probably experienced over the last couple of years, you know, our society trying to teach us these new rules that we call political correct rules. You've probably experienced it, haven't you? The pressure that we feel to do these things so that we can be seen as good people. But friends, these new social rules are nothing more than man-made rules. Whoops, I shouldn't have said that. You can't say man-made. Can you see what I'm saying? They're silly rules that are put on people so others can feel good. And although these Many of these political correct rules you know, are silly. The advantage is it allows some people the extreme pleasure of feeling good about themselves while they condemn other people. And friends, if you've never experienced this feeling of you know, pride that people have because they're good and other people don't do what they do, well, try this experiment. Sometime during the week, buy some KFC chicken, find some young, committed vegans and start eating your chicken in front of them. And very soon you will feel their displeasure and their disgust as they see you, you know, and your immoral behaviour because you like to eat meat. Friends, it doesn't matter if you believe in God or you don't believe in God. We still want to be good. We still want to be seen to be good. And friends, this is true for every single human being. Why? Because God has put that desire to be good in every single human heart. You don't need religion to feel and to have that desire. And so in our modern Australian society, which really has, you know, rejected God as the source of all goodness, well, we have another standard of goodness, an ever-changing standard of goodness that we now call political correctness. And if you do those things, you're a good person. And if you don't do those things well, you're cancelled. You're bad. Why do we do it? Because we all want to be good. And if you don't have God to show you what's good, you'll make up your own goodness. And you will persecute other people with your own goodness. Now, friends, we can laugh, you know, at these silly political correct rules. And many of them are, you know, very silly. And we can laugh as as Christians at those rules. But still we have to be very careful. Because religion can very easily end up in exactly the same place. Loving rules and not loving goodness. And that's what happened to these Pharisees, these people who I I guess started well. They really wanted to please God. But over hundreds of years, they lost their way. And they became so focused on man-made rules that they couldn't see the good that God was doing through Jesus. 
And that's what we're going to look at today. These people couldn't see the goodness that is in Jesus. Look at verse 9, thank you, Isaac. The day on which Jesus healed the paralysed man was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leaders said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath. It's illegal for you to carry your mat. But he replied, oh, the, the man who made me well said to me, pick up your mat and walk. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, now you are well. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. And from then on, the Jewish leaders began harassing Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules. You see, friends, what is Jesus doing here on the Sabbath? Well, he's healing people. He's fixing them. He's giving them a new life, uh, new opportunities, a fresh start. He is teaching about how you live your life well with God. I mean, that's why he found him in the temple and said, look, you've he I've healed you, but be careful. Stop sinning. Follow me. Follow God. Or else something worse can happen to you. Which makes you think, the worst that Jesus is talking about must be pretty bad. I mean, he was paralysed for 38 years. What could be worse than that? But that is what Jesus is doing on the Sabbath. He is busy doing good. He is busy doing God's good, giving people a new life, a new chance, a new type of life that you live with Jesus in your life. But what do the Pharisees see? Well, they only see Jesus breaking their man-made rules. That's all they see. They see a man breaking the rules they have made up. And so they begin to harass Jesus. You know, they put pressure on him. And friends, you have to use your imagination because if this was happening today, all the Pharisees would, would be on social media, you know, condemning Jesus, typing furiously on their iPads and iPhones, condemning Jesus, calling for Jesus to be banned from the temple, saying that he's full of hate speech and, you know, saying that he's Sabbath-phobic or something. That's what the Pharisees would do if they were here today. They would use whatever means they could to condemn a man for doing good. But friends, this is where it starts to get very interesting. Because Jesus doesn't shrink back. You know, Jesus doesn't apologise. He doesn't say, oh, I'm sorry if something I did, you know, offended you. Jesus doesn't do that at all. Instead, Jesus looks them in the eye and he calmly tells them the truth. And friends, the truth is a very dangerous thing for someone who wants to live by their own rules. Look at the truth that Jesus says. Thank you, Isaac. Very short. But Jesus replied, here's the truth. My father is always working, and so am I. That's the truth. God, my father, is working. And I am working with him. Now watch the Jewish leaders. So the Jewish leaders tried all the harder to find a way to kill him because Jesus was not only breaking the Sabbath rules, but now he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now friends, this is not Jesus meek and mild here, is it? At all. He's being firm. He's being strong. He's speaking the truth. 
And by speaking the truth, he has made things much, much worse for himself. Because before he was just breaking their Sabbath rules. But now, when he says those words, my father is working and so am I, when he says those words, everyone knows what he means. He means my father and I, we are equal. And friends, to understand you know, how this works, we really have to sort of think about how the Jews and their sons related to each other. You see, in Jewish society, uh, the oldest son, the firstborn son, would get everything when the father died. You know, it didn't matter how many children they had, the firstborn, the eldest, got all the money, all the possessions. What belonged to the father belonged to the son. And because that was true, the father and the son were equal before the law. And so when the Jewish leaders hear Jesus say, my father is working and so am I, what they hear is Jesus saying, my father and I are one. That's what they understand. And it makes you think, though, why does Jesus confront them? Why does he take the hard road? Why doesn't he just sort of disappear for a little while, go into a little country town and just wait until the feast is over and the Pharisees have gone back to checking on bows on women's dresses? Why does Jesus push and confront the Pharisees? Why does he make this controversy about the Sabbath worse? Well, I think Jesus makes it worse because he loves them. He speaks the truth because he wants these Pharisees to know the truth about him. Because only if they know the truth about him will they ever be freed from their life of self-righteousness, pride and contempt. You see, friends, the Pharisees, they just want to talk about rules, their rules. And they think if, you know, I just follow my rules, then I'm a good person. As long as I don't do anything wrong, I am a good person. But that's not the truth. Never has been, never will. Because the truth is that a good person is someone who loves God with all their heart, mind, soul and strength. And a good person is someone who loves their neighbour as their self. That is the truth about goodness. That has always been the truth and will always be the truth, no matter what silly rules we make up. And so Jesus knows that for him to move these Pharisees from loving rules to loving God and loving people, Jesus really has to shake them up a bit. He has to confront them. He has to get God's truth and put it right up into their face so they can see the goodness of God, the power of God, the mercy of God. And so they can see that Jesus works with God to do God's good. And so that's why Jesus says these words in verse 19. He said, I tell you the truth. The son does nothing by himself. He only does what he sees his father doing. Whatever the father does, the son also does. Because the father loves the son and includes him in everything he is doing. In fact, the father will show him how to do even greater works than healing this man. Then you will truly be astonished. 
Now, friends, I want you to look at the last word that Jesus says on these, in these paragraphs. The word astonished. That is what Jesus wants these leaders to be. Astonished. Astonished by him. Astonished by his healings. Astonished by his healings, his teaching. Astonished by the love that he treats people with. Jesus wants these proud, self-righteous, arrogant men who deformed a religion to make themselves feel good. Jesus wants them to be astonished by him so that they would understand that God is good and that God is doing good in this world and that Jesus is working with God to do God's good. You see, friends, only that truth, that God is good, that Jesus works with God, only that truth can break through the hard, stubborn hearts of these men. Now, friends, do you remember back in John chapter 3 when Jesus met another Pharisee? A man named Nicodemus? Do you remember what happened? Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. Do you remember what he said first? The first words he said to Jesus. He said something like, good teacher, we know that God works with you because only, you could only do the things you do if God was with you. You see, Nicodemus, he wasn't perfect. He had a lot to learn. And Jesus tried to teach him. But Nicodemus, the Pharisee, could see that there was something about Jesus that was different. There was something about his healings and his teachings and his personality and the way that he treated people. There was something in all of that that showed him that God was with him and that he was working with God. Friends, Nicodemus, as flawed as he was, could see that truth. And that is not a small thing. Because when you see that God works in Jesus, then you will come to Jesus. And if you humbly come to Jesus, he will give you life. That is what Jesus offers. Anyone who comes, as soon as you come, because God is working in him, and you know that, a whole new world opens up for you. Whole new opportunities open up for you when you come to Jesus because you know that God is working through him. Look at what Jesus says about these new opportunities. Thank you, Isaac. Verse 21. Because just as the Father gives life to those he raises from the dead, so the Son gives life to anyone he wants. And the Father judges no one. Instead, he has given the Son authority to judge, so that everyone will honour the Son just as they honour the Father. Anyone who does not honour the Son is not honouring the Father who sent him. I tell you the truth, anyone who listens to my message and believes the one who sent me has eternal life. They will never be condemned, but they already have passed from death to life. Friends, how do you honour the Son, Jesus? How do you do that today? How do we do that today? Well, Jesus says, accept my message. Receive it. Accept it. And friends, that message 
is a gift. Eternal life. That's the message that Jesus brings into the world. It's a gift he gives. Life with God. Eternal life with God, an eternal kind of life that you live with Jesus right now. That is the truth that Jesus brings into this world. And Jesus will give this precious life that he has in himself to anyone, even the Pharisees, even the politically correct social justice warriors today. Jesus will give his life to anyone who lays aside their own petty ways of being good. Jesus will do it. He wants to do it. He will give you his life if you will set aside all those made-up ways that we have for feeling good about ourselves that makes it possible for us to condemn others. Friends, 2,000 years ago, Jesus was trying to teach the proudest people in the world. The Pharisees. The most self-righteous, arrogant, religious people. And he was trying to teach them to stop honouring yourself. Don't look for honour from other people. Stop condemning other people. Instead, honour the Son. Because as we do that, God's life comes into our life. And we begin to experience the eternal kind of life right now. Friends, at the start of the service today, we began by saying the Lord's Prayer. And the first words are, Our Father in the heavens all around us, honoured be your name. Now, why does Jesus begin there with God, honoured be your name? Why does he begin there? Well, Jesus knows that when you honour God, that's when you step into life with him. When you put him first, when you stop playing those I'm a good person games, when you stop thinking I'm better than the other person, when you honour the son, that's when you begin to live life well. That's when you begin to become a good person. And that's when you begin to escape all those little games that we play to make ourselves feel better than others. Friends, the truth is the Father is always working for good. Even today. And the truth is that Jesus, the Son, is working with the Father right now through his word, through his spirit, through his people. And so really the, the message for us is the same as for the Pharisees. Honour the Son. Start honouring the Son and begin to experience God in your life. Friends, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, uh, we can see, however dimly, that you are worthy of all our honour because you are equal with your Father and you are working with your Father even now to do great good to save people from themselves and to bring all people, men, women, everyone everywhere, you're bringing them, inviting them, inviting us 
into a new life lived with you. One that frees us from human standards and lifts us up into your very presence. Lord, please help us work in our hearts so that we would want to honour your Son with everything that we have. And we ask this for your glory and for our good. Amen. Now, friends, uh, we have a few questions, I think, there, Isaac. Uh, the first one is, how do we honour God? And secondly, how does honouring Jesus free us to be a good person? Now, they're, they're pretty tricky questions. How do we honour God? And how does honouring God, honouring Jesus, actually free us to be different and to be good every day? So you have five minutes, and then we'll come back together. So enjoy your conversations.
Yes, yeah, we say in this prayer together, I invite you to respond at the end of each paragraph by saying the words, Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray for all people and for Christ's church here on earth. Almighty God, your son Jesus Christ has promised that you will hear us when we come to you in faith and humility. We pray for peace in the world and for purity in the lives of your people. In the middle of all this, of all life's troubles and hardships, please help us to see the good that you are now doing all around us. Help us to be thankful for every good thing that comes from your hand each day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Precious Father, we pray for our Archbishop Glenn Davis and for all our church leaders. Please help them to rejoice in your love and truth. Help them to honor your son above all else and help them to join with you in spreading your life, giving word to all people. Lord, in your mercy, Lord. Lord God, we pray for our government. Please help them to lead with justice, wisdom, and companionship, especially during this difficult time. Give them the wisdom to make good decisions that will benefit our city, our state, and our nation. Lord, in your mercy, hear me. Everlasting God, we pray for the aged, widows, orphans, the sick and suffering. Please comfort them and bring them closer to you. During this difficult time, come to them and care for them. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy God, we pray for the poor and the persecuted and for all who care for them. Please guide them and give them perseverance, strength, as they do good. Lord, in your mercy, hear. Lord of all, please work in our hearts so that we will share the resources of the earth and that we will live in trust and goodwill with one another. Lord, in your mercy. We praise you, Lord God, for the eternal life that you so generously give to anyone who responds to your Son, Jesus, with trust and confidence. Hear us, Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Now, for those of you who've been reading the Bible together online, uh, you would have read this during the week. Uh, this is a, a little section that the Apostle Paul uh, wrote to a church in Thessalonica. And it's a wonderful summary, I think, of how Christians should be, how we should see the world, how we should live. So we're going to finish today just by saying these words out loud together. Together. Rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in everything because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Don't restrain the Holy Spirit. Don't hate prophecies, but test all things. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from all evil. Amen. Enjoy your morning tea.